Good morning. Welcome to our session on office ergonomics. My name is Kathy Espinoza, and I'm a board certified ergonomist with Keenan and Associates. We're going to tend, take about 20 minutes of your time this morning and talk about how to make your workstation and your home computer stations a little bit more comfortable for you. So what is office ergonomics? Office ergonomics is the relationship between you and your computer. If you're spending eight hours a day sitting in that chair working on your keyboard and your monitor, we want you to be comfortable. So ergonomics is not about the most up-to-date, fancy, fancy equipment or stretch breaks or training sessions. It's about taking your knowledge of where your equipment should be and suit it for yourself, having the confidence to make those adjustments. So what are we trying to prevent? Well, we, number one, want you comfortable on the job. And today we have an awful lot of millennials entering into the workforce, and maybe you own a few millennials at home. So I do want to stress that this information is something you can take home and teach the kids about, because if they know how to set up their workstation, their gaming devices, their iPads, iPods, all of their media devices, it's going to help them stay injury-free for their entire lives. So we're trying to prevent something known as musculoskeletal disorders or cumulative trauma, repetitive motion injuries. And this isn't something like I bent over and I lifted up a 300-pound box because, number one, you want to get help lifting a 300-pound box or using a dolly. But these are injuries that build up little by little by little by little, and you can't really pinpoint when they occurred. One day you're just kind of shaking out your hands thinking, ooh, they're going to sleep, they're numb and tingly. Or maybe your foot falls asleep often because you sit on your foot while you are at your chair and your computer monitor. But they just build up gradually over time, like putting a bean in the jar. Every time you sit on your foot, you're putting another bean in the jar. Every time you work with your wrist bent in an awkward position, another bean in the jar. And one day, you all of a sudden start to have symptoms. Doesn't mean you have an injury, it just means your jar is almost full. And that's the point, you really want to take it, make attention to these symptoms because that's what's important. All right, so let's get started. We all think of aches and pains as related to something I must be doing at work, but we really have to understand that a lot of it is because we're getting older. Boo. What happens to our bodies as we get older? We gain a little weight, okay? Our vision changes. We're not as healthy and active and strong as we once were. But in addition to that, our society today is just doing too much at one time. Uh, this is called multitasking. And when you're talking on the phone, trying to get your work done, or talking on the phone to your kids and making dinner, we multitask beautifully, but we're multitasking ourselves right into an injury if we're not careful, because we're sloppy when we're doing it carelessly and we pick up some pretty bad habits. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at your wrist and fingers and what's putting that bean in the jar. We're going to look at neck and shoulders as well as your low back. So when you start off looking at wrist and fingers, the areas that we worry about most are things called carpal tunnel syndrome. And sometimes this is a numb and tingling in the first three fingers, sometimes into that ring finger, but usually the first three. When you have symptoms that are like odd like that and you think, what's going on? I look for what people are doing with their wrists. So I'm going to look at the keyboard. I'm going to look at the chair height, anything. You'll notice that picture on the right. She is working on her keyboard with her wrist planted on the desktop. That's a huge beam going into that jar, huge wrist factor, because we want to always try to type with our wrist straight or you hear that term, float your hands over the keyboard, rather than planting them down on a wrist pad, wrist rest, or the actual desktop. So let's look at some practical ways to eliminate the risks for something like carpal tunnel. 
Notice on the back side of your keyboard, the photo on the left, there's little feet there. Okay? When people work with the feet up on the back side of their keyboard, that almost forces their wrist into this bent and awkward position. And that puts beans in your jar. That's putting the risk factors there. So put the feet down and flatten out your keyboard. This will allow you to work with your wrists in a straight and neutral position, kind of like a handshake. If you shook someone's hand, your wrist is straight, turn it sideways, nice and straight. It opens up that tunnel inside those carpal bones and can eliminate all kinds of problems. So what else do I see? People will put the feet down and flatten out their keyboard tray and then they'll angle it up on their articulating keyboard tray. So look at the photo on the left. Is this any better than working with the feet up on the back side of your keyboard? No, it's still the same problem. It forces your wrist to bend. So I want you to follow that picture over there on the right. You wanna try and get your keyboard as flat as possible. Better yet, even angle it down a little bit up at the top. So that's called a negative angle. That's hard for people to get used to, so if at least nothing else, let's get it as flat as possible. People always tell me when I go out to do an ergo eval, I have a pain in the back of my neck. I have my shoulders just ache. And a lot of that is related to where your keyboard is on your desk. When you're working at your keyboard, are your upper arms right next to your side? or are your elbows way out in front of you, like the photo on the right? The farther away your elbows get from the midline of your body, the more headache you're gonna take home at the end of the day. So pull that keyboard closer to you. You wanna work with the elbows near the side of the body. So I always ask people, I want you to pretend that you've got an orange under your armpit when you're using the mouse or typing, okay? So let's look at the photo again from the one before, over here on the right. This person is gonna lose their orange, okay? So again, I want you working as if you've got an orange in the armpit and you've gotta keep that arm and the elbow close to your body when you are working. What about your mouse? Take a minute as we're going through this webinar and look, where is it? Is it right next to the keys on your keyboard? That's where it should be. The closest you can get it to your body, the better off you are. Some people have it on a desktop above them. Some people have it on a side desk to the right of them. Take a look at the bottom two pictures. Are they holding that orange in their armpit? No, they're not, and they are gonna ache right in that right shoulder and the right arm going down. So that's gonna make it very tense. If you have no place for your mouse right next to the keypad of your keyboard, you may wanna think about using a numbers bridge. This is the top right-hand picture up there, and if you aren't using your keys on the right side of the keyboard and you can get away with using the numbers along the top portion of that keyboard, this little piece of plastic sits right on top of those numbers and you put your mouse there. This will allow you to continue to work with the orange held tightly and your elbow close to your body. So rule number one, as you're sitting here listening to this, Elbows need to be level with the space bar of your keyboard. So if you're sitting in a chair right now and you're thinking, huh, where are my elbows? And you put your hands on your keyboard and your elbows are lower than that desktop, you need to raise the height of your chair. The way we commonly do that without raising our chair height is we pull our shoulders up towards our ears. And we do that unconsciously so our elbows and our wrists are all level with the space bar of the keyboard. So rather than tightening up your shoulders like that, let's raise the height of the chair to where your elbows are level with the space bar. Or those of you that have an articulating keyboard tray, you could lower the keyboard down a bit. 
be careful you don't lower it too low. If your chair's too high or your keyboard's too low, it forces you into working with your wrist in a very bent and awkward position. And again, in that position where they're bent down on a keyboard, it creates a bend in that carpal tunnel area and it can add to a bean in your jar. All right, again, keep the mouse on the same level and as close to that keypad on your keyboard as possible. How many of you have a carpal tunnel pad? Okay, these are there to kind of soften the contact stress right up against that wrist area. But the problem is when people use it, too many times they're used incorrectly. People will go ahead and just plant their wrist right on top of that carpal tunnel pad and then reach as far as they can. You can't play a piano by putting your hands down and just hoping you hit every one of the keys. That's why it's important to just float your hands over the keyboard as you're using it. And remember, carpal tunnel pads are called a wrist rest. So while you're wrist resting and while you're poofing what you're doing, then you can set them down and you've got something soft in which to rest them again. All right, next up, let's talk laptops. Wonderfully convenient device, but they weren't built for an ergonomic eye, all right? If you work with your laptop on your desk, you made it. You've got your elbows level with the space bar, but unless you take your head off and put it right down on your lap to make the monitor at the proper height, it isn't going to work. So I have a few practical solutions for you at work, at home, and any of your college-bound kids. First off, if you're going to be using a laptop longer than 30 minutes, set it up on two reams of paper and attach an external monitor, an external keyboard and an external mouse. This allows the monitor to be higher and with the external keyboard and mouse, you've got your arms by your side, elbows level with the space bar and that works well. I have one child and he's over six feet tall I had to put three reams of paper under that laptop to get it up to where that monitor was up at his eye level. If you're gonna be on there quickly uh, after maybe less than 30 minutes, just open up the back of the laptop more than you think is normal and that should help. All right, we talk about putting beans in the jar and that's important to remember that your body is a 24 hour a day machine. So it isn't just the wrist bending in an awkward position while you're at work. It's everything that we're doing contributes beans into this jar. So let's talk about driving. Where can you put your hands on a steering wheel where your wrists are in a straight and neutral position? Some people drive with them at 10 and two, and that kind of dates us when we all had to take driver's ed and they offered it in high school. Some people do nine and three, which some people say that interferes with the airbags. Some people do four and eight, okay? Some people drive with one hand. People that are late for work drive with their hands up at 11.55 and 12.05. Now, can you imagine the bend on the wrist there? Does though, when you're driving, does that contribute to the adding of the beans into your jar? Yes, it does, okay? I've got a picture down there. People drive with their knee and they eat their cereal on their way to work. Not recommended, <laughs> Wrist and fingers, thumb trouble. I'm getting more and more issues with people whose thumbs are killing them. Used to be this was a decoir vein injury back in the 40s and the 50s from a punch press operator, but no more. It's coming from holding our devices, okay? Texting, swiping through pictures on your iPad. So be very careful that you're not using your hands as a grip, a vice grip for that phone. They have devices that you can attach to the back of a phone, slide your fingers through, and that releases the thumb from having to hold it. I also worry that people drive with their thumbs on that steering wheel. And when we drive in areas that have a lot of traffic, like your organization, sometimes we get stressed and we put a lot of pressure on those thumbs. So 
that is carpal tunnel. When I see issues with the first three fingers, Something else that I've noticed a lot is something called cubital tunnel syndrome. And this is where we get a numb and tingling in the ring and the pinky finger. And I see people shaking it out. It's a bizarre feeling. Have you ever gone to bed at night, put your hands up underneath your pillow, you're so cute and cuddly, wake up in the morning and you feel like your arm is falling asleep? We're pinching off a nerve that runs right around that elbow, the ulnar nerve. This is also known as when you hit your funny bone and you hit that nerve and that pain zooms right down into the ring and pinky fingers. So when people start getting this at work when working on a computer or at home after work on their computer or their devices, I look at how much leaning, how much elbow bending are you doing throughout the 24 hours in your day. So. Let's go ahead and talk about leaning. Are you a leaner? There are people that are habitually have a habit of leaning. They lean on their desktops. They lean on their elbows when they're tired. Uh, they lean on the armrests of the chairs, okay? When we're doing a lot of leaning, this leads to contact stress. So the leaning, you are tweaking off that elbow and you're pinching it really tight and that nerve is squeezing around that elbow. So we wanna make sure when we're working, we're opening that up. So you don't want your chair too low. That causes a tighter bend in your elbow. So raise your chair up if you're having any of these issues and watch the amount of leaning that you're doing. I'm not a big fan of arm rest only because many times you can't pull your chair up close enough because of those armrests. And what does that force you to do? Forces you to lose your orange, okay? If I can't get close enough to my keyboard, I'm gonna have to reach forward for that keyboard. Takes my elbows arms away from my body. Now, there are medical reasons why people need an armrest. Some people have difficulty standing up, getting in and out of their chair. So this would be a good option to have. So just be wise on how much leaning you're doing both at work and at home. If you notice that you've got a very sharp edge on the desk and you're doing a lot of writing work where you're pressing that sharp edge of the desk right up against that forearm, this can create some of the numb and tinglies that we're feeling in the ring and the pinky finger. So either raise your chair up a little bit to where you are writing with your forearm completely parallel to the desk surface, or get a pad that you could rest your wrist on while you are writing. Okay, we have something known as a soft edge, and you can cushion the whole front of the desk with something like this, but carpal tunnel, gel-filled carpal tunnel works just as well. If you read the newspaper every morning with your cup of coffee, when you're leaning on your wrist on the kitchen table, you can take that gel-filled carpal tunnel pad, put it down, and at least lean on that where it's a little bit softer. But our goal is to get rid of that bad habit of leaning. Another thing that bothers the wrist is keeping the hands flat on the desktop and then leaning in. And I see this a lot when people are kind of talking to each other. What did you do for dinner last night? Oh, where do you want to go for lunch? without realizing, or standing and using a mouse from a standing position, as you can see on the picture in the right. Okay, that puts a very awkward bend on the wrist. In addition, when you are leaning with your hands flat on a desk, you've got 100 pounds of pressure on that bent wrist, wrist and that could be a high factor for injuries. Let's go even farther. We tell you to exercise, which is Fabulous, get that blood going, and we'll stay, we need to stand up throughout the day. But after work, if you go and you're doing something like push-ups and you're already doing a job that is very labor intensive, sometimes that can be another risk factor into that jar. So there's alternate ways to do push-ups. One would be a wall push-up where you can go ahead and keep your wrist much straighter. So push-ups are great, don't get me wrong, but if you've already got some of the symptoms where you know it's being aggravated, then watch out with everything you're doing in the day to try and avoid that deep wrist bend like that. So 
let's go back to driving. All right. Our body is a 24-hour-a-day machine. What are we doing when we drive that seem to be irritating that nerve, causing them and tingling in the ring and pinky finger? Well, one of them, you roll the window down, beautiful day. Let's just lean our elbow right on the door's edge, like the photo on the left. Anybody do that? What about that little console between you and the driver and the passenger seat, and you just lean on that with your elbow? Okay, now we take our cell phone and we bring it up to our ear, which we're not supposed to be doing, and I know none of you do, but notice how tight that bend is on your elbow when you're talking on the phone like that. Okay, that's creating pressure on that ulnar nerve, and all of these things add a bean to your jar Little by little by little, and that's what cumulative trauma is kind of all about. All right, even pencils and pens. You know, you've all heard of Dr. Grip pens, and the reason they work is because they're wider, they're fatter, they're non-slip, so it doesn't take as much force to hold on to them, okay? You can take a pencil pillow and put it over a pen, and all of a sudden you've got a wider non-slip surface, so that works just as well. For some people whose fingers are tired of writing, you can use a gel type pen and that will go ahead and increase the comfort level and it doesn't take as much force. Or you can, instead of having your fingers between the thumb and the first finger, put the pen in the, between the finger one and finger two. Your penmanship is exactly the same and it's less stress and force on your hand. So watch out putting pressure or using your hand as a tool, like a date stamp. Okay, that's putting pressure right across the palm of your hand. There's a different handle you can use, a big, long, straight one, so that it's not pressing against that median nerve. There's always a better way to do something. So let's talk now about neck and shoulders. Okay, what happens is posture will follow your vision. If you're working at a computer and your monitor's over in the corner on the right side, well, where's your posture gonna go? You're gonna be twisting your neck and working over there. So I really focus when neck and shoulders are involved, I focus on where is your monitor. Monitors for somebody under age 40, <laughs> um, top of the screen should be about eye level, okay? Now realize that Bill Gates owns that top two inches of ribbons all across the top. So the text, the readable text, should be about at eye level. And I joke about being over 40, but what happens to your vision as you start creeping up over age 40? It gets harder to see the screen, especially with the small font. Posture follows your vision. So people will bring their head in closer and closer and closer to their monitors and they look like this little turtle in a half shell where their head is sticking forward. Take a minute and pull the monitor closer to you. You'll have one of two options, bring your head to the monitor or bring your monitor closer. Then you get to be about 50 and they give you bifocals. Lovely thing, you're so happy you can see, but too many times we put that chin up because we're trying to look at the monitor through the lower portion of the bifocals. When you go to bifocals, bring your monitor down, down, low on the desktop, because that way we can keep our head in a good, solid, straight position. If you notice you're bringing that chin up, that monitor needs to go down even farther. Dual monitors are another topic that we have nowadays, and okay? most of us have them. Let me ask you this, which one is your primary monitor? If you're using both, then you want to have them centered to your body as the photo on the left. You want that line between the two monitors right even with your nose so you're not twisting. And bring the edges in a little bit, the far sides away from you and that monitor, bring it in to where it's like a V. And that way that'll help minimize the twisting that you've got to do. If you're basically using one monitor, and the second one is just to kind of keep track of your emails, but your primary monitor, you want that centered to you. So you're gonna scoot the left side monitor over to the left. You can even turn it vertical 
to give it less space that your neck has to twist to see your email. But if you're only using the one as a primary monitor, get it centered with you and at the correct height. Another important thing to remember with dual monitors is that they really need to be at the same height. If one's higher than the other, if one's off center, it's gonna annoy you and we don't want that. So let's go back to multitasking. We are all masters of multitasking. One of the things we do is we squeeze the phone between our ear and our shoulder, okay? Because we're just trying to do too darn much at once. Use the headset. If you're at home and your kids are calling you and you're talking on the phone, trying to make dinner, get your headset on, pop your phone in your pocket and, and talk. Try to get away from squeezing that phone. A big issue we've seen in the most recent years is something called tech neck. And what do I mean by this? It's holding your device and reading emails or watching a YouTube, scanning your social media. Okay? The farther your head bends forward, the more pounds of pressure is on it. Posture follows vision. Take a look and, at how you read emails on your phone. So if you pick up your phone and your phone is right next to your stomach, look at how far forward your neck and head have to bend in order to view that. One good piece of advice is to lock your elbows right by your side and bring that phone up. Doesn't mean your elbows leave your side as you bring the phone up. Then you're just swapping one problem for another. Lock the elbows by your side and just bring the phone up so that it is closer to eye level, and this will help. How many of us have an e-reader? We've seen them, we've seen them with kids as young as two. These mobile devices are just that. They're not stuck to a computer, a desk, a monitor, a chair, a mouse. They're on the couch. They're in the kitchen while we're cooking. They're everywhere, they're mobile. So that's really, really hard. Get your devices up. So if you're candy crushing with your iPad on your lap, again, your neck is taking a very awkward bend and it only takes about 20 minutes before you feel that pain. Put your iPad, your Kindles, your e-readers, set them up on a pillow or a table. And take an eye rest often, okay? There's a 20, 20, 20 rule every 20 minutes. Stop for 20 seconds and look 20 feet away. Just glance up at the corner of the room where the ceiling meets the wall. Okay, that's 20 feet away. It uses different, so when you're on a small font machine like that, it'll give you an effective eye break. I also love Microsoft Windows. On the very bottom right on that bar, there's a size slider. So you could be at 100% or you could take it all the way up to 150%. I love it. Well, my kids tell me it's an old lady font because my font runs at about 72. <laughs> Guess my age. So it helps. So I'm not trying to look at something size 12 font on there that I can't see because I will pull my head forward. All right, remember to don't be reaching up. Grab four inch binders for the big cubby. Okay, that's up to reach those. Grab them with two hands. So one is on the back, one is underneath. And a better spot would be to take and break them down into two inch binders. That's much more manageable for your hands. Finally, let's look at the low back. Statistics show that 80% of all people will have back pain in their life. Most of the back pain is genetic. And believe it or not, research is showing that if your mom or dad has had scoliosis or a big typhosis, uh, these things happen and they are genetic. So it's so important that we prevent back injuries. So you may have it in your genes, so it's extra important that you're careful not to add these beans to the jar. I always ask people, are you an exclamation point? Are you People come to work and they're straight, they're beautiful, their posture is awesome, they're optimistic for a brand new day. Uh, when all
going home at the end of the day and they have this rounded question mark posture, a hunched over, looking for money position. Now, people I hear often tell me, I say, how did you hurt your back? I sneezed and my back blew out. Well, sneezing doesn't cause your back to blow. It was just the final bean in that jar that took you right over the edge. So that's what we want to watch out for. So just a tiny bit of anatomy that you want to realize. Most people have some herniation or some bulging in their disc, okay? And, and they don't have any symptoms or any pain associated with it. Some people do. Your back is just a bone and a cushion, bone and a cushion. And this cushion is like a jelly donut. It's got a very soft inner fluid inside of it. If I am constantly bending forward, okay, working at my computer, let's go back to that turtle in a half shell, okay, where her head is coming forward on there, then we're squeezing the jelly in our disc backwards. And sometimes that runs up against a nerve that goes down the back of the leg. Maybe you've heard of the word sciatic pain. Okay, this can be a numb and tingling in your hips and buttocks. It can go down to your knee, or it can be pain and burning, or your foot falling asleep all the way down to the toes. But there are many ways to prevent it. So let's go ahead and talk about a few of these. And remember, at work and at home, it all contributes to the same jar. So step one, always sit back in your chair. Okay, the number of people I see that are leaning forward on their chair, feet up on the wheels on the bottom, ready to go, that doesn't do you any good. So sit back in the chair and make sure you've adjusted your chair. At your organization, you may have people that rotate different shifts. Somebody messed with my chair. It's important that you take responsibility to sit down every single day before you start and make sure your chair is adjusted. One of the things I want to point out, when a chair has a backrest that is touching the seat pan, that chair was never adjusted. You've got two knobs on there. One could be on the picture on the far right. You unscrew it on the backrest and you raise it up and tighten it down. The chair on the bottom has got a knob right underneath the seat pan on that bar. You can adjust it, pull that backrest up and tighten it down. People say, well, where should it be adjusted to? On a chair, you want the rounded portion of the chair to fit right at your belt line. What does that do? Having that at your belt line pushes you into a very natural curve on your back. And this brings that jelly in your disc right back to center. I walk around and a lot of people bring their own support devices for their back. If you notice the picture on the left, her chair was never adjusted. So what she's trying to do is provide that lumbar support at the belt line when in fact the chair can do it if she takes the time to unscrew it and raise the backrest. The photo on the right shows someone who's got a back support, but it's too high. She's almost got a bra support. Okay, way too high, it's actually pushing her forward. Okay, I wanna talk a minute about ball chairs. This is something that's become very, very popular as of late, <clears throat> excuse me. Ball chairs, I don't believe in them. I think that there's a lot of risk. I think that you can fall off of them. I think that they are best used in the gym. Okay, so again, you're able to slouch while you're working on these things and there's too much risk. One of the best studies that have come out in the past few years is that we are sitting way too long on our jobs. American workers sit an average of nine hours a day. Damage to our body from excessive sitting happens when you are sitting longer than six hours. And this isn't six hours continuously, it's a total. So on your drive to work, um, the morning shift, sitting down having lunch, afternoon shift, drive home, candy crush saga all night long, how many hours are you sitting? Okay, we see an increase in obesity, a lot of stress eating. So we need to get up 
every hour and change positions. This might mean every time that phone rings, you stand up to answer it, okay? It might mean to program your outlook at 10 o'clock, two o'clock, stand up and stretch. Okay, if you've got stretches available on your work product, your work computer, use those. Instead of emailing, walk over to somebody's desk. What do you wanna do for lunch? Easy to email. Even better if you take a walk. Um, master the stairs. Drink more water, because you'll have to go to the bathroom more often, and you've got to walk there to get it. All right, chair height. Remember, raise the chair or lower the chair where your elbows are level with the space bar of that keyboard. Now, if you've raised your chair to get your arms correct, and now your feet are hanging off the floor, consider a footrest. You want to have your feet supported, and that's very important for people that are more height challenged. Also, clear the clutter from underneath your desk, okay? Just like the armrest, if you cannot scoot under your desk far enough to where you can work with that upper arm close to your body, holding on to that orange, then it's gonna keep, give you many symptoms of aches and pains in the neck and the shoulder. So, to summarize, number one, take the responsibility to adjust your workstation. Make sure nobody has sat in it the night before, or if we think, oh, these desk, these chairs are just terrible. Take a moment and adjust the chair. A lot of times, it is just in the adjust adjustment. When you go home, your chairs, adjust them at home. Adjust your monitor, your keyboard. You got kids, take a peek at what they look like when they're sitting there gaming for three and four hours. Those kids are our future new hires. Okay, and they've got a long road to toe with technology. Stand up every so often, and the rule of thumb is at least once an hour, every 30 minutes if possible. Stretch out often and stay fit to keep your body healthy, healthy, and strong. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope this helps. Keep your body strong, so take care and adjust your world.